Hello and welcome to the Voice of Reason podcast. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's guest is Chris Bentliff, who is a marketing expert who, quote, studies and buys from brands who do interesting things. I stumbled upon his YouTube channel uh, last week, and I found somebody who is really interested and knowledgeable in the ways in which marketing shapes our conversations with the devices that we buy and also the internal workings of us as consumers. Very rich and interesting fellow. So I had him on and that's kind of what we talk about. We talk about technology, design and marketing, but the way in which we think about these things or the way in which he thinks about these things, I think really maps on to other well, let's say, movements within the taco sphere, within the ideological sphere, the ways in which we are attracted to buying into ideas really does align with the ways in which we buy physical products. And from that place, we launch into the ways in which uh, we could be better, more responsible users of technology and the ways in which the technology is shaping us and how we can gain control of that shaping. So without further ado, here is Chris Bentliff. Every couple years, I uh, get really seduced by an Apple product and I geek out on videos about uh, a new product and your, your video on the latest iPhone you took it to another level, uh, just in the composition and the personal, uh, you, you made a addendum to it that was very personal, very poetic. And, yeah. uh, it was like, Oh, who is this guy? And then I went into your stuff. I'm like, this guy knows a lot about this certain field that I haven't really studied much, which is marketing and uh, buying and selling kind of commerce stuff. It seems like, and then the design that goes into relating to customers and, designing and stuff how did you get into that i think i'm um my career trajectory comes through communications through the arts and so i studied music production and engineering and i've been a touring musician and i've done i've done you know songwriting and all these sorts Hmm. of things that are an important part of connecting on a sort of human level to people and in that was always really interested in uh the technology I was using to ac- to accomplish that stuff, and I really loved you know locking myself in a studio for hours and hours and just um, getting something to be exactly the way it would be in my head by you know turning knobs and turning dials and things. And um, over time, then I would I, I got into design by um, honestly it was like designing the posters and CD covers and whatever for my, for my buddies and I. And, um, then I received my domain name as a gift in like 2000 from somebody and didn't know what to do with it, but reverse engineered the HTML code from some of the bands I liked and went and spent 50 bucks at Barnes and Noble. And I just like lost my mind. I thought, Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Which is just now for 20 years, you know, has just led to deeper discovery of, uh, usability and I'm really fascinated with the intersection of sort of the human experience and the tech uh, that's around us and I think we've lost the plot a little bit when mm. we're focused on things like refresh rates and you know pixels per inch that's super interesting but like this stuff is uh, it's transcendent I mean it's uh, mm. it's amazing and I'm I have not stopped being just in awe of the things that people can create, you know, and and that we get to benefit from that. And I think um, as a communicator, I'm interested. That's a story I'm way more interested in. And so that's part of what you saw in the last couple of minutes was, I don't know, somebody said it was a love letter to iPhone. And I it's a, it's more of a I kind of exist in a in a really critical space about tech. So if it's not good, I'm just as sort of ruthless feeling about it but if it's good i start to think about like you know the headphones i use like wow thank you headphones all day long you give me so much opportunity to like immerse myself in something where i can work and i don't take you for granted like i think about things like that and then i think about the human being on the other end of that who spent like forever you know making 3d models of this thing or chiseling it out of clay or sketching it up and going into meetings and getting his ideas tossed out or whatever And what a process it was to get to this place where now I get to sit and like complain about it, you know, Hmm. and, and I think that that's interesting. And, um, 
so that's part of what I explore, I think, on my channel, too, is just the tech is interesting and important and the nuances of it, but what we do with it and how it uh, presents opportunities for us is, for me, what's really fascinating. There's, you know, talk about late stage capitalism, there's uh, negative associations with materialism and consumerism, too. And what you're doing, what you're showing, or what you're expressing right now, and what I see you uh, expressing on your channel is going through to the next level. And it's almost like the human being ricochets off of the material or the tech to the other human being. There's this uh, bypass, or and, and our attention can get stuck on the material or stuck on the buying and selling. But what you're, what you're showing us uh, is the, the psychology involved that we're kind of having a conversation uh, or these things are tools that can possibly uh, distract us from what they can give us access to. It, well, what's interesting, I talk a lot about marketing. That's what I do in, in some of the channel and some of the videos too. And um, marketing is often uh, synonymous with manipulation. Yeah. And it, it can be that. And it, it uh, we live in a, we live in a in an era where that's that's rampant with some of the tools that we depend on every day, but it doesn't have to be that. And um, really, it's marketing at its best is storytelling. And um, when we can immerse ourselves in that story, the manipulation is no worse than the compelling soundtrack to a movie we love. It just mm -hmm. adds to the overall sort of aesthetic of this thing. I am wired in such a way where I'm I'm constant I can't not see behind the curtain on that so I can understand what they're doing and why they're doing it and then part of what I think is interesting is to share with others here's why you're seeing some of those things and here's why here's where they're doing a great job with that and here's where they're not in my opinion and that just extends to design um, it extends to industrial design. It, in, it extends to interface design or usability design. The things we have and hold, or even the way that, uh, you know, if we go into a broader, the way rooms are designed or, or the way lighting works. I mean, all of these things are meant to make us feel a certain way when you get past the utility of it, if they're doing a good job. And if they're doing a bad job, we know it right away. If they're doing a good job, we just sort of take it for granted and complain about the tiny little nuances where they're getting it wrong. And I think that's interesting. I think it's interesting that we've gotten to a place where we look for, we look to be critical. Like we look for, and that's okay. I'm not, I'm not in my, in, in my own way critical of that sense of ourselves. I'm just a little bit fascinated with it. Like we, we look for the thing that is wrong, but we don't often look for the thing that is wrong in a way where we hope to write it. We just like to look for the thing that is wrong. And um, there can be value in that. But there's also just value in sort of appreciation for this stuff. And you're absolutely right. I think consumerism and uh, things and objects, we shouldn't lose the plot on that stuff. So wherever we can, and i talk about this in the video that you mentioned, where it can be a vehicle for something else, that's what's really interesting to me. You know, where it can be, uh, where it can be an opportunity for us to know more about something about ourselves um, even if it's that, you know, a simple thing is uh, the office chair we sit in. Well, it's it provides a comfort to us, a literal comfort. But then there's a psychological like this is where I sit to get work done or to read or it's my favorite, you know, whatever. Those things, it's why we give names to our cars like these things. We create emotional affinity for them. And I don't think that's silly. I think that's OK. And uh, where we can be. Um, as thoughtful about that as maybe we even are in our personal relationships with intention. You don't have like 6,000 friends. You've maybe got like three people that you can really count on. Well, then it gets into sort of this idea of essentialism, like just surround yourself with the things you need okay. to, uh, you know, to feel good about that stuff, but not so much that it's extraneous or superfluous. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're talking about one thing, but this really maps very well into my wheelhouse, which is cultural criticism. And uh, there's different problems that uh, our society gets really obsessed with. And then I kind of critique 
the criticizers. Um, but I think that it really maps out. What we're talking about is the human being. And yeah. it just so happens that, well, I was going to say material objects are more stable, but tech is always being innovated. The question is, um, how do you know when your critical capacity is overreaching, when you're no longer actually encountering a problem, you're creating a problem in your desire to critique a problem? Uh, I, I see, you know, in, in our society, we have so much that we take for granted that we focus on, you know, the so-called microaggression or, or the, yeah. that small thing. How do you know when you're being productive with criticism? I think that's such a, a sort of subjective thing because what's micro to me isn't micro to somebody else. So, you know, how, um, uh, how if I was a serious, talking about games or, or technology or, or phones, I don't do any gaming on my phone. If I did, I would have a completely different sort of threshold for excellence. Um, and so I can take that and sort of make it writ large. There are there are things that don't matter to 99% of us, but to a small percentage, it really does. But if those people are really, um, you know, fired up about it, then it, it can cause uh, either attention that is productive or it can cause attention that is... Um, I think we need to double ask ourselves. So if I go back to the iPhone 4, there was a problem with the antenna. Yeah. And um, it became a whole thing. And in the it real world. It had a gate. Yeah, it had a gate. Very few people actually experienced any real world issues with that. But it became a narrative. It became a conversation. And so Apple had to address it and whatever. It led to de design changes down the road. Okay, well, we won't we won't probably do that again. But and so maybe in in the long run we were all better for that. But in the moment there was a very small number of people for whom that was, you know, a problem. But it it became something that became uh, an object of criticism for everybody. So now everybody who who had a you know was going to make a video about the iPhone four needed to point out yeah. something that isn't necessarily going to be relevant to everybody else. For me, when we get into that sort of conversation, it's it's not uh, an empty conversation. It's not an invaluable conversation or a, a non-necessary conversation. But it isn't where I think the most interesting things reside in that. You know, I think, wow, when we've gotten to a place where Steve Jobs has to talk about you should hold your phone different, <laughs> like we've – what are we even doing now? Like – I, that's where I fall back into my sort of, yeah, but look at all the things it can do. And I totally get the criticism people would have of that. Like, what about ism? You know, kind of stuff? You know that that's just such a looking at the world through, you know, rose colored glasses. But for me, I don't know. There, there needs to be levity around some of these things that, uh, that should be complemented with a broader perspective on some of how, how I think it works. There's something, you brought up the iPhone 4, there's something so momentous about that object. It's still with us, and I go back to it. Um, I remember the introduction of it. it. It was this astounding moment that I don't think we appreciate, or anybody who's born after a certain year won't appreciate, where Steve Jobs just swipes his finger and pinches to Zoom, just like these small things. It changed the whole world. And changed the, the whole story world. about how blackberry completely collapsed is absolutely astounding how this one uh, object had such an impact and and changed us for life and i think part of that at a ten -a gate was because so much attention was to that the the iphone 4 release everybody stood in line it was this huge really odd and uh, i'm almost nostalgic for when uh our our society converged on on a on a tech, uh, a piece of tech rather than a, a political situation or something like that. It's true. I mean, it was a nice relief valve, I think, for everybody, you know, to have something um, sort of simple, you know, that, that we can all sort of point to. And I think that's a lot of pressure for a company like Apple to have to deal with. And if you go back, we did it with Microsoft Vista. Oh, what a, what a train wreck Vista is or Microsoft 95. The first thing that the first software people stood in line to get. I mean, we love to use tech and this is part of my fascination with it as um distraction but it's yeah. also um there's a community around it and uh some of the community is you know segmented into like super hyper nerds and a lot of people just love it a lot of people love 
you know, Apple for what it does design. I know people are like, oh, no, I hate Apple. I love Samsung. And I know in your wheelhouse, you can you can create connections to how there, those those parallels exist. But when we find some other dynamic that lets us sort of put our creative energy, mm. we're getting to a place now where the tech is all so good, it's getting harder and harder to sort of – that's why I say we're starting to find these tiny things to like – like everybody's camera is pretty great now on a phone. And so you're spending a lot of time if you're Apple or whomever on stage talking about these tiny nuances that very few people are even going to understand that makes mm-hmm. your camera better than somebody else. The fact is when somebody's opening Christmas presents or whatever, they're going to take a picture with whatever their device is and it's going to be pretty good. Like it's going to, you know, and all they're going to do is put it up on social media or whatever. It, like it's a very small number of people who are professional photographers who are looking at this stuff in such a way, you know, or some other use case with the tech. So I think it's interesting how we sort of coalesce the people that see the, the things that we see and that that becomes, you know, what's important for them in their discussions. And I, I like to think wider and broader about it. I think those things are important. They're just not maybe the most important all the time to everybody. And to some of us, they're not important at all. And that's valid, yeah. too. Yeah. One of your videos, you have this uh, pair of videos, and I'm going to have to lean on you to explain what they're about. But one is about the way that uh, marketing operates. And you break it down into three categories, transactional, transactional, uh, practical, and experiential or aspirational. And then yeah. you have uh, you, you discuss the motivations in, in our buying decisions. And those things uh, form a really good uh, kind of loop. And it yeah. seems like, just to reference what we were talking about, the that that g- geekiness or that really fine tuned, uh, you know, we're going to talk about the megapixels and the apertures and stuff like that. That that has more to do for a lot of buyers just like knowing that they're going to have a better experience. It's it doesn't they don't really actually care about the actual tech, but knowing that there's all this fanfare around the tech that they can listen to these numbers kind of adds to that aspirational aspect of owning uh, this device, even though there's incredibly, uh, you know, the, the, the returns getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. It, um, that gets into sort of the psychological nuance. And what I say in a lot of those videos, I've got another one I'll be uploading like today that's in that same kind of wheelhouse. And what I say is, the companies that are marketing to you know this about you. So it, it would be great if you could know this about yourself because you you maybe don't haven't put words to this. Um, but, you know, part of what you're talking about with the transactional and the and the practical is transactional wants to save money or spend the least practical wants to save time or have convenience. But the aspirational wants to have a really great experience. And it takes time to develop the trust where that's what I'm looking for from you is a really great experience. Most of us want to start by saving time or by saving money. And we don't know about ourselves that we would love to be dedicated to a single thing. Like we we would love to say, this is the company I buy this from. We don't know that about ourselves. We think of ourselves as a lot more sort of, I'll go wherever it's cheapest, but that isn't true. We start Hmm. there, but we quickly move into, you call this guy, he's really good at, you know, or the next time this thing breaks down, I'm just going to go there because I had a really good experience with, you know, whatever. And um, the brands know that about us. So if they can do a good job sort of nurturing that part of us uh, with not just products, but with messaging and with experiences, part of what I talk about in the video you're mentioning is that I can go to Walmart on Black Friday and buy an iPad and save a few bucks and somebody will unlock a chest for me and hand me a thing. That'll be it. Or I can go spend a very similar amount of money at the Apple store and I can have a free setup and a class and they'll do this and they'll do that for me and they'll let me touch every device and they'll answer all these questions. It's an experience. For some people, I just want to go buy the thing and I'm going to wait for Black Friday so I can save a few bucks. It doesn't matter to me. And other people are like, oh, wow, I'm definitely going to go to the Apple store next time because I had such a great experience. You can apply that to anything, hotels you've been to, uh, who you like to have your car serviced by, where you like to buy groceries, the layout of the store that gets back into design. Like that matters to you. You prefer Mm -hmm. Target over Walmart or you prefer, you know, the dollar store because you know everything's cheap and you don't care how it's laid out. Like those things that matter to you, those brands know that and they're when they do their best work, they're trying to – 
they're trying to amplify that part of you. And they all want you to be aspirational because that means you're going to come back again and again and spend more and more money with them. And uh, it's up to them to impress you and up to you to be open to that impression. And many of us are, more of us than we think, are open to that impression. Mm -hmm. There's something slightly creepy about that, about marketing and, and about these companies, uh, these impersonal machines uh, of, of all these moving parts, these huge corporations really trying to become close to us, really trying to uh, become our friend in a way. It, it, it really is operating on a human psychological level where we're actually establishing a relationship with a brand. Um, there's easy critiques about that, uh, shallow critiques about that. Um, but you're saying that there's always a truth to that. No matter what, that will be active in us. We'll, we'll always be uh, longing for that. And the smart company is going to be aware of that. In our turn, we should be aware of that too. Yes. And that's where it comes back to some of the things we talked about earlier. It's easily manipulated. Yeah. Um, and that's where, you know, as you're talking about, there's some of the some of the easy criticisms that we can make around how manipulated that is. There's a difference between we want to get to know you and we want to sort of harvest every ounce of data about you so that we can then later leverage that against you in an almost predatory way. I talk about that in one of my videos, too, how it's um, hmm. when we can be in command of our technology, uh, it often feels like it wants to be in command of us. So we have to be mindful of that, you know. But if we go back, way back before any of this, Back when, you know, uh, Wheaties was coming up with slogans and way back in marketing before it was understood to be marketing, it was just the same thing. And that's part of part of what I like to sort of remind myself sometimes is is companies used to have a much more sort of wholesome way of just trying to earn your trust again and again and again and make it so that, you know, you were they were who you thought of when it was time to think of this thing. We've turned it into in technology has has certainly been a huge part of that and probably been the advent of that um we wouldn't be having these conversations if if you know zuckerberg hadn't been in his dorm room in harvard putting this stuff together but we've turned it into something where we're super skeptical and that's okay we should be and we've turned it into something where um there's a lot of trepidation that's okay we should be but there's something really great about like a line of great copy you know, or, or uh, words on a page that are just zingers and just bring something out or a really great campaign that makes you, you know, smile. That's that's amazing to me. That's the same as somebody writing a horror book. Can you imagine making me feel afraid by words on a page? Ah, that's amazing. Or making a film and making me cry in the movie. Like, good job on you. You put all these parts and pieces together to make me feel the thing you wanted me to feel in that moment. And here, I'm willing to be distracted with it. Good job. <laughs> that is, a, for me, a very different experience than, and we have a really fine-tuned sensibility on this, than, uh, oh, I see what you're trying to do here. You're trying to make me cry. Or I see what you're doing here. Your stupid, obnoxious music that's clearly telling me somebody's hiding behind the door that isn't scary to me at all. Like there's a, it's a fine and easy line between when we're being manipulated and we know it most of the time when we're being, when it's open to us, it's when it's not being open to us, hmm. you know, algorithms and things like this that I think that just feeds yeah. a fire for us that now burns very hot and out of control and, and good marketers, uh, ethical marketers, like, like I, I certainly hope to be and want to be and try to be, uh, we have to work constantly against that so that, even when you tell somebody you're in marketing, <laughs> you, they don't gloss over with, oh, you're one of those. You know, I try not to be one of those. Yeah, and we don't all have to be one of those. And the, the experience doesn't need to be like that. But uh, it is uh, often. What's the uh, what's the first principles then for ethics and marketing and and compare and co contrast that with an unethical marketer? Like, don't lie. Like, start, start. Don't be dishonest which is like mm -hmm. small things like don't use we if you're a sole proprietor you know on your website we build amazing things no if you're just a person be like i build this and i do my best like that's okay don't um don't use there's things online called dark patterns which is just an extension of a lie and a really stupid and simple example is if you are on facebook and you start a post and you decide yeah actually i thought better of that i'm not going to say that and you hit the x button in every other case, 
in your digital life, when you hit the X button, it closes out and it's gone. But on Facebook, they really don't want you to not do that. So the words will stay inside that post even after you hit the X as sort of a subtle nag to, hey, come back and finish that. Come back and finish that. Hmm. That's, a, in my mind, a, whenever there's a behavior that isn't expected, that's a lie. That's them trying to get them to do what they want me to do instead of better facilitate my way to do uh, what I wanted to do there. And this is rampant in digital marketing. You'll see it in pop-up ads. You'll see it in uh, the words that are being used or, you know, how often have people, it's only $3 and then in the fine print, it's $13 recurring monthly revenue and you have to call us in order to cancel. You can't just hit a button yeah. on our website. We'll make everything as easy as possible for you to buy it and we'll make it as hard as possible for you to stop. Those are all lies. And that is a huge problem uh, in digital period, but certainly in marketing, um, when we start on a, unethically, we can never finish ethically. You know, we can never start with a lie and then hope to create a wholesome, mutually beneficial relationship. We've started on the foundation of something false. And so that's that's the, the simplest way. And, and my radar is always up when I have clients that are like, what if we did this? And I don't have a lot of these, but it's almost always a, a signal that we need to sort of come back together and figure this out because hmm. we can manipulate ads. We can manipulate. We can use the data available to us in Facebook to do, you know, to pinpoint really crazy things. And sometimes we have to ask, well, should we do that? Like, is that the right thing for us to do? Why would we do that? What's the benefit to our potential customer? Imagine we're going to be with this person for five years. Do we want to tell them that we got you in here by sort of manipulating the reality around you so that we could get you in here is mm -hmm. we all know how ads work it's okay to have a great ad but there's so much data available to us that people i always tell my friends it is scary what i know about you hmm. and i i mean that in a uh, conceptual way but you know the 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 targeting that's possible with this stuff is straight up invasive you know and and um very few of us know that the trade off for us has been I get to see pictures of my classmates, kids and puppies, and I'm going to give you everything. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. And we don't know or appreciate what that trade off has been. We don't know, appreciate the pain that it has caused the collective. We I mentioned that inside, mm -hmm. uh, I think, the iPhone video um, that, that you talked about that, you know, it's this device is amazing. All of this tech is amazing. It's amazing that we've got a platform where I can see my my classmates, kids and puppies. That's tremendous. But we need to understand um, our own capacity and responsibility to it because they're not going to be responsible. You know, nobody nobody on their end is going to say, maybe maybe don't make that post. Maybe that one you're going to regret. That's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. They just want the engagement. They want the likes. They want the algorithm stuff. So it creates a, a new reality of uh, awareness, I think, and responsibility for us that few of us are even, yeah, you know, prepared for or understand. I think that that that's ultimately um, something that uh, we might even need education on, like deliberate. Every school kid gets like digital health, uh, digital I behavior. I agree. As a parent, my daughter's thirteen years old, and we've had so many conversations, and she's off, you know, figuring out all kinds of things. And, well, Almost weekly, I, I remind her, if you see anything online that makes you uncomfortable, stop and let's talk about it. Okay. And, you know, we don't we don't have enough conversations about this in a structured way to sort of point out, here's how this stuff works. Here's how if you make a post when you're 21 years old and you try to apply for a job at 45, you might have to answer for a person that you no longer are. Like, we don't think about that. We just don't. And the And the tech isn't designed to help us think like that. It's designed to just be an outlet and and never a, a responsible sort of um, considerate outlet, you know? Mm -hmm. I can see how being exposed constantly, uh, being hyper online, being exposed to manipulation, uh, overt, uh, well, it's, it's, it's implicit, but in an ad, at least you know the ad is an ad when you know the ad is an ad. But then behind the scenes, there's all these algorithms and the platforms are shaping us and taking from us and giving to us. And uh, when you become aware of that, it seems, I'm just spitballing here, but it seems like you go through, a, one can go through a process of becoming calloused at first and then cynical 
and then even conspiratorial and and start to see like oh no like you know, big tech is shaping our world they are sure. maybe they aren't you know so how how do we thread that needle and become ultimately responsible but like you know going through that process of becoming calloused and cynical how do, how do we maintain <laughs> it's tough i think one of the questions that i always um ask and i i've tried to share this with a lot of people in my own social networks is like please understand how this stuff works like it wants you to do this the reason that that is made so obvious you know the reason the button is blue instead of green is because they've tested you know forever and they've realized blue is going to be more likely for you to click it like there's a there's a system at work that you aren't aware of that is trying to get you to do a thing so ask critical questions and you're right it can quickly lead to like crazy but just ask questions like who does this benefit most me doing this thing or you know the app nag that comes up hey you haven't checked in hey you haven't done this and you know if you games it can be like you know you got to wait seven hours or you can pay fifty dollars now to get 50 coins or whatever like who does that benefit and they're they're constantly using behaviors and proven behaviors around habit forming and, and things like this to try to trigger us to take some action and we can take simple things by just removing the app from our phone like there you go that's easy now you now you now it's harder for you to get involved with whatever it is that they want us to do so i think a huge part of this comes down to uh being responsible for our own behavior as much as possible with this stuff and and that's really hard if we just it's like surrounding yourself with junk food all day and then saying and that's all that's in your kitchen but then saying i'm going to eat well today like if you constantly have the app on your phone and it's up on your computer at work and you're constantly checking and and you don't have any sort of systems around you to sort of moderate this it can quickly become such such a habit that i mean how many of us have the image in, in our mind of going to whatever family vacation or christmas and everybody's sitting there with their noses in their phones because they're scrolling on whatever instead of being together that's we can't even be critical of each other with that anymore because it's just how it is. Well, we hmm. need to we need to be more thoughtful, I think, about where can I take steps with this tech? And that's not you're not going to win the fight of uh, I'm not going to check Facebook as often. I think that's been proven. You're going to have to take some steps. You're going to have to remove it from your device. You're going to have to so that, you know, create some points of friction. It's only on my iPad that I can go check Facebook. So I have to leave and go and do whatever, whatever it is, but at least it puts you in control. And maybe then if you spend a little less time with it, Facebook is just an illustration here. It could be anything. It could just be your phone. Uh, you know, don't have it next to your bed at night, put it in a different room to charge up. Just do that and see how, see how it changes your relationship with the tech. Because when we're no longer in a healthy relationship, like with with anything, when we're no longer in a healthy relationship with these amazing things around us, we don't know it. Like we we aren't aware when the relationship has become unhealthy. It's only when we start to see the the impacts of that, you know, that dysfunction, time not spent in the right ways or in the most productive ways, or or being stolen from what could be with family or whatever. It's only then that we sort of realize. And when people start making jokes, oh, there you are on your phone again. Like that's one of those like there's a truth hidden inside that joke and yeah. maybe we should be yeah. thinking about that, you know? Yeah. 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 So being somebody who's a content creator, just speaking on your YouTube channel, um yeah. what are you trying to add? Um and what are your thoughts on reaching through that medium, people's phones and connecting with them? And how do you how do you do that? And what's kind of like the intention and then kind of the talos or the goal that you're you're aiming for? What's interesting is um, I started on YouTube a long time ago just with some little marketing videos that I thought were beneficial to, honestly, in my mind, it was like, if I if I was going to communicate with a potential client, it would be great to have a video where I could talk about this. So it was super utilitarian. And like so many of us, I kind of went through a real creative funk here during, you know, this shutdown era. Mm. And one of the ways to sort of help me get out of that was just to start creating and I do that a lot for my clients, but I thought it would be great to have an outlet where I could just do whatever. And I, I spend a lot of time giving advice uh, to people, hey, which phone should I buy? Hey, did you see the thing that happened today with Apple? Should I get that? And I know 
you know, it's my mom asking or something. So I, I have a sense of like, here's how to answer that. Nope. You should get the cheapest one, mom. And here's why. And it'll be great for you. And, um, so I started to kind of think about, it would be, it'd be fun. I have a point of view on some of this stuff and I'm opinionated about it. And those opinions are known to the people around me. I'm also a communicator. I also, um, enjoy, uh, creating and the art of creating. I enjoy finding the right music and, I've got all these skill sets around me that I use for the benefit of so many others. It would be really fun to sort of, I don't know, put, start putting this stuff in, in a way that, um, that others could, could, could experience it too. I did not expect some of the success that the channel has had. Um, there's like 600 comments or something on the iPhone 12 ultimate review. And so many people are, uh, it, it was really evocative for so many people. I had, I have no, like, this is what I hope to achieve. And so yeah. all of that yeah. was a surprise to me. I just had a point of view on this and I call these, these things sometimes on the channel a review, but really it's just a point of view. Cause so many others, when you ask, what are you trying to add? I mean, there are so many others who are doing great reviews who are going to put yeah. like six headphones side to side to side and like tell you exactly i'm not that guy i'm not even interested in that like those people have command of that situation i think for me i have a real interest in the story behind this stuff and and it's not just the story of who made what but it's it's like the story of how i use it and it's probably similar to how you use it you know we all have years of photos that are on these devices and those photos mean something to us. And, um, this thing was just, uh, I say in one of the videos at its best iPhone is not a focal point, but it's a lens through which points can come into focus. That's true of all the tech around me. Like at its best, it's not something that's going to steal from me. It's mm. going to help me do something more. And I'm as much in charge of that relationship as anything else. And for me, you know, I've had to create some systems and processes to alleviate that. I talk about in that video, I don't, I have a clean home screen because I don't want to be enticed or distracted into start tapping on things. That's a small thing that I do to have a healthy relationship with something that I really enjoy and really applaud and really want to have experiences with. So that gets into, for me, all kinds of things that I'm, you know, excited to do on the channel, uh, productivity and how I work and things people are curious about the automations that I showed in one of the videos, people are like, Hey, tell me more about that. Cool. I will. Cause I've got opinions about it and you know, hmm. we'll see where we go. The home pod uh, mini just came out. I've got opinions about how Apple has marketed that and uh, I'll be sharing those opinions. And if it resonates awesome. And if it doesn't, that's okay too. Cause I'm, uh, I'm just trying to, I think share a little bit, just a tiny little vision from my little angle in the world that is, uh, where we as people intersect with these with these gadgets yeah and um and what an interesting space that is and we don't necessarily spend enough time there we're so focused on the shiny and the flashy and the what it does instead of the what it does for me and i'm interested in that part in the process of taking all the skills and your knowledge and your experience and assembling yourself you are creating or recreating yourself online do you have that's any thoughts on on that process or you know, do you have any reflections yet that's interesting um almost almost you mean like a persona i guess so um whether i, I mean the, the people will see you as a, as an individual but it will be a persona of you so in that process which it sounds like for what you're saying there was an urge to do something to take a leg up and then you're assembling yourself but now you emerge on the other side as something that you've created that people consume you, you've kind of that's fascinating isn't it uh yeah what it, that came to mind that comes to mind in some of the comments people leave where they will talk about me in the third person like i'm not reading the comment and um i think that's amusing and it's interesting in and i've had several business conversations uh as a result of some of these videos and uh, some of them will get on and um, I don't want to overstate this, but there's almost a sense of uh, we have to get past this moment of like, he's a real person. I mean, yeah. and, 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 uh, and that's interesting. And, um, only in that moment, is it interesting? You know, I'm, I'm thoughtful about the responsibility that I have 
as part of the machinery of content creation. Look at me feeding the algorithms of Google that I was just talking about. Like yeah. that's interesting in its own in its own space. Um, but I, I I guess I'm thoughtful about, and this is in in real time sort of emerging for me. Just being an agent of those things that I've talked about that I, I think are are valuable, but maybe uh, less easy to find these days. Honesty and integrity and um, plain spokenness and hmm. um, uh, vulnerability. Uh, I'm okay with that stuff when it comes to sharing my relationship with these parts of it and who that makes me seem or be on the other side. Um, I guess I have to take responsibility as that as the outcome of the ingredients that I put into it. So if I just keep putting my best into it, I'll be very proud of whoever I'm perceived to be on the other side of it. And, uh, I'm not a bombastic person. I'm not a, I'm not a, um, I'll never be using this channel to sort of seek, uh, attention. Um, if that attention comes, it'll be as a result of doing things that uh, I'll, I'll feel proud of having shared. And then it will be easy for me to be in that space because uh, mm. I, I won't be trying to be somebody I'm not. I won't be concocting or manufacturing some persona or some, Yeah, you know, I'll just be a it's reflection. Sustainable. Of, yeah, you know. And, and granted, you're seeing that at the end of hours and hours of editing and fine tuning and these minute little things. So it's, it's the best self-projected, but I'm okay with that too. Well, I, I asked that kind of to to reflect your knowledge and wisdom and experience to young people who want to be creators or any 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 age really just people who want to start out be, becoming a creator and being really uh thoughtful or at least having some sense of reflection about the process that you're doing when you start a podcast or you start a YouTube channel cuz you know a lot of people are doing that right now because of the lockdown too. So I was just uh, wondering about the, the process or the thoughtfulness of that. I think you really gave a good answer of uh, kind of sticking to those first principles so you know that you can continue to do this or, or it adds up into something that won't exhaust you or turn you yeah. into something you're not. And, and, I, and I'm, I bet you relate to this, you know, in your own sort of uh, way. But it's just um, if, if you if 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 one goes out and they think to themselves, I want to become a influencer i mean good luck to you what does that even mean you you <laughs> these things are products of what you put into and so um hmm. i think it's a smart idea to have a vision for this stuff it, had i i think i could have probably put more thought into you know what does good look like with this and and probably would have benefited from it because really i'm just kind of riding it as it goes and, and sort of finding my voice as i go and figuring out what i think is really interesting but you know, I'll never be the guy who goes and like spends ten thousand dollars on stuff that isn't valuable to me, so that I can review it on my channel. Like that isn't me, and that that level of inauthenticity wouldn't I couldn't do that. So if you have a mindset of like, I'm going to start a podcast, I think you have to back up from there to I have a point of view, or I'm curious about a thing, or I keep repeating the same things to enough people where maybe others would benefit from this too. Or uh, there's a lot of this, but not very much of this. Like, that's part of what I saw. In fact, my whole thing started with the Hermes Apple Watch, which when I was doing my research on that Apple Watch, there was just very little on YouTube that I could find. And I'm a person who likes, like, every angle. Like, sh I can't get enough showing it to me from everything if I'm in that sort of research mode. So that's the video I built. Like, here's this watch, and here's it from every angle. Here's in a couple different outfits. Like, I wanted to see... I made the thing I wished I could have seen. Huh. If that exists for you, this thing, I wish this thing existed and I don't see it, then create it and there you go. Like now you're on your path to whatever that outlet might be for you, podcasting or YouTubing or blogging or graphic design or whatever it is for you. Um, hopefully it solves some problem, even if that problem is one that you understand. A recurrent concern, and I think we're, we're really wrestling with uh, especially social media, and part of that is that we have the computers that we no longer think of these things as computers. They're ourselves, and they're in our faces all the time. Yeah. And then we have these yeah. platforms where we make connections with people, and they can turn into real connections. You can have authentic connections through Twitter, you know, if, if you set it up right. And Absolutely. You and I have been communicating through Twitter. Like, there's that's absolutely true. Yeah. 
But at the same time, we're, we're watching, um, or I'm concerned, there, there are concerning patterns in the way that it's shaping, specifically uh, 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds, uh, this, this young cohort. It's very easy for um, them to not really be aware that they're being swept up into a fantasy land. That, that has a thousand voices or like this huge chorus of a million people uh, manipulating them. And, and it's not even these platforms. It's just these ideas can get loose in the water. And, uh, and so uh, you already kind of mentioned that, but what are some of the ways that we can teach, especially um, people who are young and developing, to be responsible and to kind of be, be aware of themselves in this completely d- new landscape? What's interesting about that question is um, there's a flip side to it, which is the much older. And so there's a digital literacy that we lack that only a a certain segment of our whole sort of population has. And, um, And so many others are required to figure out how it works. And can you imagine not, can you imagine missing out on so many of the opportunities that so many enjoy because you don't understand how to take a selfie. Like there are people, you know, older, older, uh, people who Mm. this is not natural to them, this device. It's, it's not how they prefer to communicate. It's not. And so now you're a a 60 something salesperson and your, your 20 something manager has told you that, you know, you got to be more active on LinkedIn. What? that's that's con- confusing and frustrating and so there's a whole hmm. there's a whole dynamic around um and there's a, a there's a power component to this whole thing but young hmm. people uh will they are growing up with this stuff in hand they don't know now we're now we're to a point where there's people who never didn't have a an iPhone like they've never known my daughter is 13 she's never been in a world where the iPhone didn't exist or the smartphone. Don't, if, if you don't want to think of it as Apple. So, so those dynamics of all that stuff, the streaming, I mean, I've, t- I've told these stories, like I had to have my dad send me all my CDs when I was at college. Like what, what does that even mean? So you can't understand the change in that, but these kids today will grow up with the tech. It's it's how they grow up that is up to I think uh, education systems and parents and um, uh, influential technologists who don't just um, build in systems like screen time and we can block your you know we can we can put an app where we can block whatever that's those are all um, sort of lagging indicators to there's a problem so mm-hmm. I think a lot of this comes to um, raising uh, kids with digital literacy and with best behaviors. And that should absolutely be something that's happening in school. And the the people who teach that have to be uh, savvy and native and good communicators with technology so that they're able to, um, you know, make those lessons clear instead of just, you know, something that they're reading from a page without understanding the implications of what they're talking about. So that's not something we're doing and it's something it's it's a little like we study trigonometry, but kids grow up not knowing how to balance their checkbooks or, yeah, yeah. you know, what what it means to pay taxes. Like these are real world things that we need to understand. But then that extends to our own infrastructures are getting so uh, it's interesting the people passing laws, you know, more in your wheelhouse. But they're all for the most part, it's changing. But. They're of a they're of a generation that does not understand technology, and so they're passing laws, or addressing things like cybersecurity, or addressing things like, uh, like even Facebook. I mean, when when you watch some of these, you know, hearings the where hearings, they're yeah. sitting in front of, you know, Zuckerberg, and and they're asking questions that are, well, how come when my phone does this and my grandkids like, oh my word, like we are asking the wrong questions. So so. Sometimes those folks aren't even being held to task for the right things and the qu- right questions aren't being asked because the people asking them don't understand. So there's a lot to unpack with that. I mean, there's just a ton. There's a small segment of the world who understands the value of this stuff and how to make it powerful. And they can impact so many others, even if you yeah. think about grandparents who are, you know, seeing the same sort of echo chamber thing on their Facebook, they don't know that this ad is fake or that this meme is a meme or that that image was doctored. 
and what's super obvious to somebody else, oh, that's you know, that's photoshopped. What is what does that mean when you say photoshopped? Yeah, yeah. Isn't at all obvious to someone who you know is more sensitive to that stuff. It's a yeah. problem that requires more than just talking about it. Like we're gonna have to build some systems to sort of help people hmm. become more um, literate with this stuff and more comfortable with this stuff and to understand better how it works. What shooting from the hip, or maybe you have like secret nuggets that you're already in your pocket, but what are some of the like first principles with digital literacy? And I think we've already talked about them, but to like kind of make them explicit, like the, how things work is less interesting than the, what can be done with it, you know? And, and so uh, there's a lot of like social media one oh one or whatever. And that's great. But really, we need to understand um, it gets into how it has changed or transformed communication, how there's a there's there's a less uh, formal way of communicating. There's a much more critical stance. Um, we don't benefit from the tone of voice. And so we almost not always, but we almost always presume um, an antagonism before we presume something else. And so we we sharpen our personal sort of we we hone our um our clever skills you know we we hone our um pithy comeback skills and we don't hone our listening skills at all uh, we we rarely say tell me more about that that's an interesting observation that's that's a good criticism you might have something there tell me more like we rarely do that we just dig mm. deeper in and then we kind of villainize whomever is and um i mean how many how many times do you see online honest question, you know, not trying to stir this. I just want to understand, like you almost have to preload something with diffusing all possible weapons here. I really just have a question. <laughs> You'd never do that in a, you know, a family meeting or a business yeah, meeting. You, 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 just, you know, you just ask your question, even if it's a sharp question, you're not afraid of, uh, of the fallout like you are, uh, online. So I, I don't have quick answers to that stuff, except to yeah. say that it requires, um, a broadening than just, oh, here's technology. It really gets into, here's how to communicate online. And here's what to not involve yourself with. Here's when to walk away because it isn't worth it. Here's here's when it's okay to say, yeah, this person, I'm not going to feed that, you know, that monster. We shouldn't have to have kids learn the very, very, very hard way um, not to share certain content, not to allow themselves to uh, be enticed to sharing certain content, not to dive down the rabbit holes that can be, you know, so dark and deep that they can change a person forever. You see things that you can't unsee. Like we shouldn't have to, we shouldn't have to wait for people to experience that the very hard way uh, for mm. us to be able to say, here are some, here are some best practices or some foundations, or let's start small and easy. You know, let's start small and then add just like we would, would with anything else we'll add complexity as our understanding grows instead of throwing you into the internet and hoping you find your way which is what we do with a lot of kids i think we just sort of you know and we as parents we're not even aware of what they're doing online or with their phones or you know we lock them in their room with a computer or the tablet well that hmm. could be a recipe for disaster and so we've got to take some responsibility sometimes for some of these things that we take for granted that you know my 13 year old will be operating on the same plane as I am with this stuff. And that isn't true. Or that my 65 year old, 70 year old mother will be operating on the same plane. That isn't true. Mm -hmm. I have to be responsible for that as a person who does know how this stuff works. Yeah. And I think you brought up earlier, uh, having a dialogue with your daughter about it, kind of, I guess, fostering awareness, uh, causing her yeah. to be reflective about how she feels with the different content. Absolutely. For us, being a person who knows all these things, who looks at it critically, who sees how it you know works behind the scenes, um, I've been able to use that you know for good. So, from a from a very early age, I've been able to, hopefully, I'm, I'm doing my best to raise her with this digital literacy, to have introduced it to her in healthy ways. We're we're thoughtful about screen time in our house. Um, we're thoughtful about access to this or that, but. At this point, for us, it's there's not a. I want to empower her to find you know what works for her and to do good things. But I also want her to know, and she's a good kid, so there's a, this would be a different thing if she was like out there, sort of looking for trouble. She's not that person, which is great. But 
we just have a lot of conversations. She'll be like, so then I was looking for this book and then I, I went to this and I found that that book is going to come out. So I went to this link and I said, that's awesome. Just remember, sometimes when you hit a link, who knows what you could find. So if you ever bump into that, like I, we just try to create a culture of open communication here. Like dad, just say, st- just stop and say, dad, what is this? And she'll do that. She'll be like, it's asking me for, you know, this information or the app. She knows how to buy a thing on the app store, but she'll ask me first. So we've created a trust where she's mm-hmm. not just going to go pushing buttons. Uh, we talk about it. What is this thing? Oh, it's for a game. I play with my friends. Okay. And who, who are you playing it with? Like they're easy conversations, but even for us, they're easy conversations uh, for others. They aren't happening at all. And then, like I say, it's too late by the time somebody gets involved. It's too late. We've seen the thing. We've done the thing. We've had the inappropriate experience and it's, it's painful and now I'm embarrassed and now I don't want to go to my dad or to my mom and now it's the whole thing Hmm. and uh, where we can start, you know, get ahead of all that with just a lot of communication. I think that's a a really important part of it. It, The whole thing's designed to be expedient, to, to satisfy everything that you need and the machines are getting faster and faster and faster. So they're, they're getting better and better at, at, kind of chasing you to chase them in a way kind of like there's all these lures and stuff and so fostering a i don't know if patience is the right word but maybe uh reticence or uh, just a slower being more conscious before you're being enticed or being aware that you are always being enticed i think that's really important i think a skepticism is important you know, everything, it's okay to look at things and, and ask hard questions about them. Don't just assume that it's true or whatever. But I also think a big part of this comes from not being online. Like you hone a lot of these skills by not being online, by by talking to people, by communicating with people is where you learn some of the things that you can then bring back in. Or even just if the only outlet for entertainment or inspiration is online, then you won't have ever developed the skills to do that elsewhere. You know, it's okay to be bored. It's okay to sit and look out the window. Can you imagine being on a bus or a train or a subway and not being on your phone? Like, we don't have those instincts anymore. It's okay to put that down. Don't even pull out your Kindle. Just sit quietly and, like, watch people or see what's going on or, hey, you know, take a moment. Those are ways. It's in boredom that we create ideas, you know, or that we – it's in it's in talking to the person sitting next to us that we learn how to have conversations and exist in the world. And honestly, we are losing some of these skills because we don't do it. We'll sit in our own little planets with our devices in front of us and and we won't, you know, hey, how are you today? Oh, you know, I'm having a tough day. Oh, tell me about that. Like We don't do a lot of this sort of basic communication where we can then take that those skills like empathy or patience and we can apply them later when we're, you know, online. That's when we're in command of our online relationships is when we can, I think, show up as better people. If we've never learned how to do that, then all we know how to do is be clever with a meme. All we know how to do is, you know, throw shade. Like, that's that's all we've ever learned how to do. And that's tough. That's tough. Hmm. One more thing. Um, is that the phrase, the apple phrase well, that is the thing in fact okay. they're doing uh, they're doing something i think today one more right thing now, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well what, what's what's next up for you for your channel what are, what are some of the topics you're diving into uh i'm diving into um a little bit more uh of the marketing stuff i for me that's that's really interesting and it serves some professional purposes for me so i'm diving into continuing to sort of educate or teach some of the frameworks that i have around here's how marketing works and here's Here's how it's working around you. And I want to show you some examples. Um, for me, that's really interesting. I've got some interesting brand studies that I'm working with. There's a company called Bang & Olufsen that makes really great premium audio equipment. Um, but they make such fascinating decisions that I don't always understand as a company. And I'm going to dive into that. Uh, there's a brand called Common Projects that makes uh, sneakers. And um, they do some interesting things in non-marketing by by like intention their whole mantra has been if you don't get it then you don't get it and we're not really interested that's fascinating so <laughs> their marketing has been non-marketing i'm going to be diving into that there's some productivity stuff some uh, you know i've got uh, a lot of i've been working from a home office for 20 years i've got a lot of ways of thinking about organization both mental but also physical and and um 
I'll be diving into some of those things. Uh, it's really interesting as a as a marketer and as a person to ask questions. I asked, uh, I put a poll up on, on in the community tab on YouTube and said, "Hey, what do you what do you want to hear more about that you saw in in the iPhone 12 video?" And I think there was a big percentage of about how you use your phone. Oh, I wouldn't have thought that that was interesting to you, but cool. So part of what's cool about any social media platform, YouTube in this case, is you can ask people what they think and get some really great ideas you know, for here's what, would, here's what would resonate. And as long as those things are consistent with what I think is interesting, or I've got a point of view, or I've got something to share on that, there can be some really fun things that come out of that. Where it goes and how it grows and what comes of it, I don't have a vision for that. I honestly just want to create things. What I create takes time. Uh, I put a lot of thought into it. I can't just, I'm not a one a day kind of thing. I'm not here to like talk to you as loud as I can. Um, so I'll, I'll just continue to do that. It has to work around. I have to manufacture the time around my actual job and my family and things, but I enjoy it very much. I enjoy the conversations like this one that have come from it. I'll continue to do that. I think those for me are signs of positive you know, the inertia is positive and I like that, that, that kind of tells me I'm in the river and I'll, I'll stay in the river and we'll see what happens and we'll see where down the road, uh, we are. And it's really fun to have people comment and say, I was here when there was whatever, 2000 subscribers. And that's cool. I love that. There's people who feel like they're cheering it on, cheering the channel on thinking that there's something valuable to them in a way that they're not getting elsewhere. What more could have I, could I have asked for? Um, so I'm just going to, you know, continue to share who I am in this channel and in this space, and we'll see where it goes. Well, I have to say that I appreciate your wisdom, and and I, I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. I'm not, uh, you know. Uh, I didn't I didn't perceive it that way, but okay. <laughs> okay, but your per, your perspective and your wariness. Uh, your understanding of these things, but you're also having a lot of fun, and those two things and together create like a really uh, solid thing. I don't know what it is, but that, yeah, that's thanks for pointing that out. I think that's absolutely true. Wouldn't it be awful if I wasn't having fun? Like I think I'd stop. Or if you were a foolish, I, I, I'm the fool, but so I, I'm okay with. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, I'm having a I'm having a, a really fun time, and. Um, I'm learning a lot about how others think, and that is fascinating for me as a person who um, who thinks people are interesting. You know, I, that's that's it's all been really interesting to me, and I'm I'm excited to kind of keep learning in that space. Congratulations for reaching the end of the podcast. If you enjoyed this product, consider donating to this channel via paypal.me slash Benjamin Boyce, or joining me on Patreon. Also follow me on Twitter at. Benjamin A. Boyce. Have a good night.